<laughs> I know. <laughs> Do you believe this? Me, vulgar lounge entertainer, Tonight on the show, Archbishop Desmond Tutu is on this show. I know, I know. I actually, I, I, I just, I just met him backstage. Well, we call it backstage. It's you know the corridor. And some people like to gather there because it doesn't leak like the studio. Anyway, I, I never mind that. I mean. I, I met Archbishop Tutu uh, back there, and, and I, uh, I was just introduced to him, and, and, and I started wanting to be better. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? So I'm very excited about that. It made me think of a, 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 the time, the first time I watched Oprah, when she had uh, Nelson Mandela on. She told a story about meeting, uh, the first time she had Nelson Mandela on, she met uh, Nelson Mandela backstage before... Uh, <laughs> before he came out, and she said hello, and, and you know, and you, you know when Oprah's kind of like, oh, about meeting someone, it's someone pretty intense, and, and uh, she said that she met him, and we were talking for a little bit, and then Nelson Mandela said, so uh, what's the show about today? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and Oprah said, kind of you? Uh, <laughs> It's about you. Um, and that's kind of how I feel. I feel like Oprah tonight. I, uh, this is a show about one of the most powerful, influential, uh, awe-inspiring uh, figures of the 20th and the 21st century. A remarkable human being that, for some reason, said yes to being on the show. I know. I'm as mystified as you. Take that newscasters and uh, we'll be right back. Now, it is a great day here at this show. We have a very special guest on the show tonight. I am not kidding you, Archbishop Desmond Tutu is here tonight. <laughs> what? I know! Father Tutu from South Africa. Now, I am going to ask the question that's on everyone's mind. I will say, Bishop, as a bishop, uh, do you always have to move diagonally? <laughs> I won't. It's a chess joke. All over the country, chess players are like, finally a joke for us! And one that doesn't involve queens. Although, I did tell the joke, so technically there was a queen involved. Anyway, well, never mind. Since we have uh, Desmond Tutu on the show, things are going to be a little bit different. There'll be no wacky comedy sketches tonight, no Desmond Tutu in a tutu or anything. <laughs> Father Tutu is a dignified world leader! And he said no. <laughs> he said he would like to escape from this program with his dignity intact. I'm like, fine, but you'll be the first, I said. <laughs> now, uh, you might not know, or maybe you do, uh, that Father Tutu won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. But not a lot of people know that a few years ago, he was voted People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive. <laughs> I made that up. Uh, now, Desmond Tutu is from South Africa, which I think is a fantastic name for a country, because it tells you exactly where to find it on the map. South Africa. There you are. That's what they should do. We should do that in, with some, some of the states, the harder to find ones. You know, Oklahoma could be North Texas. There you be right there. Or North Dakota could be South Canada. Florida could be uh, shaped like a penis. Uh, where is it on the map here? Oh, I see it. Uh, anyway, South Africa, of course, used to be known for apartheid. Some of the kids uh, might not remember the apartheid, um, but it was uh, basically it was uh, apartheid was an evil uh, an evil system of state-sanctioned racism. The word apartheid is actually uh, Dutch for separate hood. I know. <laughs> The Dutch, of course, have given us two very toxic things over the years. They've given us apartheid and the Dutch oven. Both very toxic. <laughs> hey, I'm just telling the news. <laughs> South Africa has a fascinating history, which I'll try and sum up for you now. Uh, but I'll do it quickly so you don't get the feeling that, you know, I'm giving you information or <laughs> all of the stuff that you don't come to the show for. <laughs> 
Rugby League South Africa, as I understand, it's a little bit like this. Uh, things were going uh, fine for the people living there uh, until the Dutch showed up in about the 17th century, and they started colonising. Now, by the way, colonising is an old-fashioned word that means stealing stuff from countries that don't belong to you. <laughs> And it wasn't the cool Dutch people that we know today. It wasn't the kind of, it wasn't, you know, with the legal marijuana and their armpit hair and their relaxed attitude about boobies. These, uh, that, that wasn't, the, no, these were the old fashioned Dutch people, the, the bastards, you know, they were angry, they were uptight, they bullied people. They could have used some of that legalized marijuana that they're so fond of. It's funny how the minute the Dutch legalized the marijuana, they stopped, you know, colonizing and just kind of chilled out and went, oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, in the mid-19th century, the Dutch colonies of South Africa suffered a horrendous catastrophe that made a bad situation even worse. That catastrophe was known as the British arriving. <laughs> the, Br <laughs> the British... The British... Ah, tell me. I the British... <laughs> they got around. I, uh... The British, what they do is they sailed out to South Africa and they saw a land rich in diamonds and gold and they said, I say, this place is splendid. What we should, we should call it, what we should, we, I love it here, we, all we have to do is just kill the Dutch people. Uh, which basically uh, led to the first Boer War and then that uh, led to the second Boer War. Uh, that was Boer War to the legend of Curly's Gold. Uh, that, that happened. Yikity-yak, stuff happens, Boer War, World War I, World War II, uh, you know, the 1948, I think, the uh, National Party takes over in South Africa, Institute Apartheid, their great idea, and then... Uh, by the 1980s, South Africa was a racist hell zone. Uh, Nelson uh, Mandela was sentenced to life in a South African prison. So uh, Desmond Tutu travelled all over the world, making the argument that doing business with a racist South African regime was immoral. And there were a few holdouts. Most people were like, you're right, we won't do it. But there were a few holdouts, people who opposed sanctions against South Africa. They were uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Darth Vader, and... <laughs> I think, I think Goldfinger as well, he was like, what, no, I, I have to do, did Goldfinger talk like that, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking of Cheney, I, I get them mixed up, anyway, oh shut up, anyway, the, uh, what happened is that uh, Bishop Tutu succeeded in getting dozens of nations to enact tough uh, sanctions that hit the apartheid regime right in the trousers, and <laughs> in the end, uh, apartheid crumbled, Nelson Mandela was released from prison and was elected president. Mandela even, in, this is an well, amazing story, Nelson Mandela invited a man who tried to have him executed to his inauguration. That's got to be awkward. <laughs> I mean, that's like inviting your ex-wife to your wedding. It's kind of like, so... How's things since you tried to have me killed? Not bad. Chicken or fish? Uh, I think it's incredible that Nelson Mandela went from, uh, you know, prison and then elected to high office. Because uh, here, recently, particularly in Illinois, people usually get elected to high office, then they go to prison. Well, we can always hope. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. See you in a minute. Um, I'm very excited about, uh, uh, about Desmond Tutu being here. He, uh, he is, of course, known as the moral conscience of South Africa. Because, you know, he hasn't stopped uh, the fight against the uh, injustice all over Africa. He's taken a, st a strong stand against uh, Mugabe, uh, Robert Mugabe, who is a dictator, uh, who uh, runs Zimbabwe into the ground. Now, they, have, they do have elections in Zimbabwe, it's true. But I, I'm not sure you can call it a democracy when uh, one of the candidates is running as president for life. You know, as... <laughs> Yes, I'd like to say that as the guy that's going to win, I'm strongly against what you just said. <laughs> I wonder how you run an opinion poll in a system like that. What do you think? I think it might be Mugabe. Yep, it might be. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you know what I want to tell you about? Just very quickly. Um, I come from a town called Glasgow in a country called Scotland. I, originally, that's where I'm from. Before I became an American, thank you. I... Uh, <laughs> 
I lived in Glasgow in Scotland and during the 1980s, the uh, Town Council of Glasgow, and I'll always love them for this, uh, the, the, there was a building in Glasgow, this is during apartheid, there was a building, uh, the South African attache was in a place called Royal Exchange Square in Glasgow. And the city council decided that they were going to rename the square and they decided to rename it Nelson Mandela Place. <laughs> And the South African consulate was right there. Now, the only way that the Praetorian government could get their mail was if they wrote Nelson Mandela Play <laughs> on every single piece of correspondence. And I think, you know, it's times like that when Scottish passive aggressivism just warms your heart. <laughs> It really does. It makes me feel good. Now, what I want to say, I think a lot of people, when you think of, uh, when you hear a story from Africa, particularly a political story of Africa, I think a knee-jerk reaction, unless you're interested in that, is to go, I can't handle this. This is a, this is a story which is, has, although it has many awful, tragic elements, it is a story which has an enormous amount of hope. Uh, this is a story which is an example um, if you imagine, to try and figure what, what this is, is kind of like, imagine, if you will, the United States of America uh, elected a president with dark skin. <laughs> now, imagine the United States of America elected a president with dark skin in 1958. That's what the enormity of what this man and, and the men that worked with them, what they did, it, it is astonishing. Please join us. We'll be right back with uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, everybody. tonight is the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. He's a passionate advocate for human rights. Earlier today he was in Indian Wells, California, speaking before uh, the Desert Town Hall there, uh, and he turned up here. It's an honour to have him. Please welcome Archbishop Desmond Tutu, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, thank you so much for being on the show, and, and, and I know you must be very tired, you just, was a 22 hour flight from South Africa? Uh, I'm looking for two clones. Two clones? Oh, uh, I see, yes, <laughs> I'm like, I, what have you been taking? What are they? <laughs> What did they give you back yet? Well, yeah, you, no, you're no, gonna I'm, need it. I'm, 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 I'm just glad to be here. But I, I think you're crazy. You think I'm crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what on earth gave you that idea? Now you've met some no, crazy. No, I mean, no, Pete no. W. Bota was crazy. I'm... No, 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 a different kind of crazy. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Yeah. You send you send them to asylums. Yeah. No, not you. We we want you. Oh really? We we, we, we want your crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Listen, I, I, I often wonder uh, when you, you you have such a reputation. I mean, I gave you a huge build up coming out. Does it does it embarrass you? Does it make you feel awkward? Did you hear the story of the woman who went to her husband's funeral with her son and? the minister did what you did about me. <laughs> and she turned to her son and said, I think we've come to the wrong funeral. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, think, no. I think you're being a little modest there. I mean, it, it can't have been easy what you, were, what you were up against then. And up against that, I mean, I read your uh, editorial in the New York Times this week. Uh, I mean, they're, they're still, you're still doing a lot of work in South Africa, in, in Africa, all over Africa. Yes. Um, yes uh, one of the wonderful things about having a dark skin yes. is that when people say things like you were saying, yes. you don't see that I'm blushing. Uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, uh, we we there's a lot of awfulness in the world. Yes, I know. And most of us know that. But what we don't also recognize is there's a great deal of good. I was going to ask you about that because yeah. you have um, you, you're clearly a, you're, a, you're a very high cleric. You're a, a theologian. You studied uh, the religions of the world, particularly your own, I would imagine. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So what I'm thinking is, uh, you, did you ever read uh, Thomas Aquinas? A little bit. Right, you know Thomas Aquinas <laughs> when, he, when he goes on about how people are essentially good yeah. and for evil to exist, mm. uh, it, it, evil is an aspect of good that if evil were the only thing then there would be nothing. That's Thomas Aquinas, yes. isn't it? Yeah. it do you, how do you find the good when you're dealing with a situation that you and Mr Mandela were dealing with, with the Praetorian government? What, what, when, when, where do you find the good in these people? Where do you find the, the ability for, uh, for uh, truth and reconciliation? Yeah. <laughs> One of the important things to keep remembering is, is that evil is an aberration. That is why you get upset. I right. mean, you get upset when a baby is abused or a woman is abused, I hope. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I do, yeah. Well, you gave me that look like I didn't. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we went, we went to Darfur. Right. And... Uh, it's one of the most awful places in the world. I mean, most of the description of it uh, fall very far short of telling you about the reality. And yet there, there were two things particularly that struck me. It was, we met with the internally displaced persons, the refugees. Right. And you you talked to them, living in the squalor and the unspeakable squalor. Uh, they could laugh, and, and the men who were Muslim were wearing white robes, clean, yeah. spotless. And you said, now where could they get the water in this place to do this? But the other, that's, his, that's the first. Well, where do they get the water, though? <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually, I mean, part of it is it, it, they get... They, they, they get trucks bringing right. it in. Okay. If the women try to go and get firewood outside of the camp, yeah. they are raped. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it really is awful. And yet there was this resilience, you know, what human, human beings are incredible. Yeah. I mean, you are incredible. Oh, no, stop. Uh, <laughs> I, but what I, I was going to... The second thing. Shh. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. No, but the th second thing is you have these incredible human beings who come, most of them from very well-to-do places who are the humanitarian workers. We hardly ever hear enough praise of, of fantastic people, many of them actually, you know, go there, it's, it's their second, third mission. Right. And you say, what makes them do that? They get no kudos. It is, it is just that they, they would not, in fact, be able to live a normal life if they didn't go and do the kind of things. So there are fantastic human beings. There really are. Is that, is that how you hang on to your faith when you see such uh, evil and, and such injustice? Uh, as, as, a, as a churchman, it must be very difficult. Or maybe it's not, I don't know, I presume too much. But is there, is there a, a test of your faith when you see yeah. how awful the, the things can be? Yes, I mean, it, it, it is that evil is evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, I mean, seek to minimize the ghastlinesses. I mean, when, when, like when people put others into gas chambers, yeah. uh, 
that's awful. I mean, there's, there's, there's no word hard, good enough to describe the, the level of evil. I mean, in, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, yeah. you, we heard some gruesome accounts. I mean, somebody says, we gave him drugged coffee. We shot him in the head and then we burnt his body. It takes seven, eight hours for a human body to burn completely. And so whilst the body is burning here, we're having a barbecue here, drinking, drinking beer and laughing. And there's a human body burning and there's cow flesh burning. And we say, what could have happened to the humanity of anyone? What, that they could think so low. What, 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 what could happen to that? And, and, and how do you find uh, reconciliation? How do you find forgiveness in, in that? It must be, it's a, it's a, it's a gargantuan task, yeah, the it idea. It is, it is, and yet, and yet you met many people, not, not just black people, I mean, white people, uh, who had this incredible magnanimity. Uh, one woman, was with friends at a Christmas party at a golf club. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the liberation movements threw hand grenades into, into the party and several of the people were killed. She wasn't killed, but she was so badly wounded. She was in ICU for several months. Now she's, she's talking and she says she couldn't, when she came out, she couldn't wash herself, she couldn't clothe herself, she could not eat, feed herself. It was done for her by her children. And, and then she says, of a, I mean, a condition that leaves her uh, in, uh, almost totally hopeless. She says, it has enriched my life. Wow. And, it's, and reach my life. This must be crazy. It's very and, advanced and, for me. And, I don't get it. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, and, then, and then she says, I'd like to meet the perpetrator. Wow. I'd like to meet him in a spirit of forgiveness. I'd like to forgive him. And then she says, and I hope he forgives me. Wow. I mean, that's mind-blowing. Is that, is that the only way to freedom, is, is forgiveness? I, I, I remember hearing something about uh, the Dalai Lama talking about he, he felt he was in danger with the Chinese because he felt himself losing compassion for them, which I didn't really understand at the time, but it sounds a little bit yes. like what you're saying. The, the, the thing is that you and I and all of us, even when we don't accept it, I mean, or understand, it is that God created us in such a way that I can't be human on my own. I wouldn't know how to walk as a human being. I wouldn't know how to think. I wouldn't know how to speak. I wouldn't know how to be a human being except through learning from other human beings. And so our humanity is bound up with one another's. And, and you see, we saw it in South Africa. If you, if you carry out a policy that dehumanizes others, yeah. in the process, you are dehumanized. Right. You know, and, 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 and so you understand now, you understand how others can say, in order for me to be me, I want to forgive you. Because, have you discovered, when you don't forgive, yeah. frequently, you feel it in your tum-tum. Yeah, yeah, right? you yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So yeah. I, always thought, I was told that resentment was like drinking poison and then expecting someone else to die. You know, the, <laughs> it has that. Oh, that, that's, that's a beautiful. Thank you very much, <laughs> it's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Father Tutu, we have to take a break, uh, uh, and then we'll be right back. We'll be right back with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. 
I'm here with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Sir, may I may I ask you a little bit about your relationship with uh, Mr. Mandela? Do, are you are you friendly? Do you keep in touch? Do you, uh, you talk? Yes and no. I mean, he's he's actually an incredible human being. I I mean, all of us have have come to accept this, but it it is for real. You know, one day I go and have lunch with him. Uh, and I've, I'm driving from Soweto to, to town where he lives. Uh, we finish the, the, the lunch, and he goes to the door, and, and he, he says, Driver! <laughs> He's calling out for my driver. And I say, well, no, I don't have a driver. I, I, I chauffeured myself from, from Soweto. <laughs> he doesn't say anything. Right. Two or three days later, he calls. Mbilo! Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't ask you, but I didn't like the fact that you were driving yourself. <laughs> and so I have asked one or two of my friends whether they can help you. And he genuinely can't stop himself when he sees what he believes is a need. Right. He wants to do something to meet it, and, and so... Now I, I, I have funds that enable me to have someone to drive me. Um, but he, he's stubborn too. Nelson Mandela's stubborn, there's news. Uh, <laughs> 27 years in prison, no, I'm not moving a damn inch, let me out. That's pretty stubborn. He, oh, no, no, but he's... He's beautiful. You, you know, often people say, 27 years. Oh, what a waste. Just look at what this guy would have done. No. Right, of course. No, because, you see, when he went to jail, he was angry. Mm -hmm. and a, an angry young person who was appalled by the miscarriage of justice that had happened. Of course, understandably. And, and it is, you know, suffering can make you bitter, but suffering can also, I mean, it burns away all of the chaff, yeah. you know, and, 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 and Nelson learned there to put himself in the shoes of the other, trying to understand how the Afrikaner must be feeling, his compassion, his magnanimity, his, his willingness to forgive those who had done him such an injustice, had done his, his people such an injustice. Incredible. And, and we, we were very, very blessed because you can imagine if we had had someone who said, we want to get our own back. Yeah. You'd still be at it. You know, I'd be still going If on. we were going to be alive still. Yeah, I that's mean, true, yeah. Our, our country would have gone up in flames. Sure. Uh, and that's why we say there actually is no future without forgiveness. Just think, if you... I know you don't this, do, do, do this, but what? if you quarrel with your wife... <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't, no. No, yeah. and I'm sure you don't quarrel with <laughs> yours either. <laughs> I know, I know. I went too far. I went too far! <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you know what would happen to that relationship if one of you didn't say those words which are in any language the most difficult? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you sometimes you squeeze, squeeze them out of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I get them out, yeah. Uh, but you, if you don't, there's not much hope for that relationship. If you just build up, build up the resentments, and one day, a very small thing, just look at the toothpaste tube. He's done it again. 
I mean, he squeezed it in the middle. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> terrible business. No, yeah. I, I hear that is what happens. I mean, I know... No, you would never no, do that. No, I understand. No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. I, I hear that they, that is what they do. I mean, you know, you throw your towels all over the place, you know, yeah. and and think that there will be somebody who's going to pick them up. Yeah, you're giving uh, away a lot tonight, Father Tutu, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just telling you about what I have heard. All right, okay. <laughs> We, we would have been in real trouble in our country had it not been that we said it is important for people to be able to tell their story. Have you found out how powerful telling one story can be? A little bit. Yeah, I know a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we had a young man. He was blinded by police action. He came to tell us his story. When he finished, one of the panel of the TRC said, how do you feel now that you've told your story? Unbelievably, a smile broke over his face. And he said, he's still blind, he said, you have given me back my eyes. Huh. That telling the story as you did in, in the TRC, it was telling it to the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, it's reported very, very extensively. It, it was an incredible rehabilitation, a wonderful acknowledgement that what he had done had not just gone up in smoke. It had happened and, the, and people and, knew and it. Yes, and that, and that he was part of the reason why we now had a free South Africa. Tell me, if, if, you, if, if you can, we're, we're almost out of time, but I, I'd love to hear you, how your feelings on the American uh, state of affairs right now the, with the election of Barack Obama. Do you, do you is this a, yeah, I thought you were. But now you realize actually just how bound up with one another we are. Sure. That there was a time when w you wished, I mean, that America could disappear from the face of the earth. Well, not, not me, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think no, some people were angry at us. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah. there, there, was, there was a lot of anger, not against Americans. There was a lot of anger against the policies of a particular yes. administration. Yes. The apparent arrogance. I mean, look at the awful things that you were doing. Not you, I mean, you. Uh, uh, no. In Guantanamo Bay, in Abu Ghraib. What, what I would say in, in defense, although I, I, I don't feel you attacking, but what I would say in defense of that is that I always felt that a very effective, perhaps the most effective, as it turned out, uh, voice of dissent against these things was from I I inside the United States. The, 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 the pressure from within eventually, you know, discarded these policies and, and, and moved away oh, from yes. them. I mean, let's come back to the beautiful thing. Okay. Uh, November, when was it? Last year, 2008. Yes, yeah. November the 4th. Was November the 4th, yeah. Because this is like my citizenship test. Come on, he's yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we were sitting, we, we were at a game lodge and my wife was sitting in front of the television and we were watching the celebrations in Chicago. Chicago, yeah. yeah. And she was sitting there, and tears were streaming down her face. And she says, I don't know why I'm crying. I'm so happy. Um, you know, and, and all of us were uplifted. Yeah. And it wasn't just here. And I, I, came, I came in January the 20th. Fantastic. I mean, I, I had a ticket and thought we would be able to wend our way through the crowds. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, it, you saw people of all sizes, shapes, and especially for someone coming from 
a former racist country. It was so heartwarming to see the number of white people. Well, actually, you would not have been elected. Uh, didn't, yeah, not but there been, is that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, and and people were walking with a new pride. Yeah. You know, and and and, and it was a palpable. You could you could feel the goodwill, the joy, the the pride. Some, I mean, uh, one some of our friends said, you know, I caught myself waving the American flag, which I used to burn. You oh, know, right. this was an American that, uh, and and now a new hope. I mean, the the world was feeling, hey. America is experiencing a kind of Mandela moment. Oh, right, okay. You know? well, here's, uh, I, Bishop, we're, we're completely out of time. I, I'd love to I talk feel, to you more. Oh, yeah, no, no, please. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Archbishop Desmond Tudor, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> Did we learn on the show tonight, Greg? <laughs> oh, how very appropriate <laughs> to have such a spiritual kitten. Well, what, what did we learn in the show tonight? Well, normally I have to make stuff up, but I actually learned a whole hell of a lot in the show tonight. <laughs> Usually it's like, oh, uh, well, you know, stuff about celebrities and ooh, I farted and everything, but... <laughs> I think actually tonight I learned that a, uh, that a vulgar lounge entertainer can share space with a Nobel Peace Prize winner and uh, look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but in my defense, I challenge you to do better. I, um, that is the single most impressive human being I have ever met. And, and I... I uh, not, you know, not the chair. Uh, uh, Desmond Tutu. And, and I... I think what astonished me was, um, if you know what, even a tiny amount of the story of South Africa, that, that people would even attempt truth and reconciliation is, is mind-blowing. I think uh, I learned more than I thought I would ever learn being a late-night television host. Who knew? Good night, everybody. is the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997, who's now the chairwoman of the Nobel Women's Initiative. Please welcome Jody Williams, everybody. Jody Williams. Lovely to see you, and welcome to. I, this questions. What about the uh, the Nobel Peace Prize? We've had a Nobel Peace Prize I winner know, here I before. I watched it. That's you watched the only it? reason I'm here. Why? Because I saw you interview my friend Desmond, and you were okay. It's Desmond Tutu. He, I, He's he, my friend, for God's sake. We email. He's really? Desmond. Yeah, of course. He's, He's a guy like anybody else. He's not a guy like anybody else. He's Desmond Tutu. I'm not getting in a fight with a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but I'll tell you, I'll come after you. <laughs> no. You know uh, something? I may not like you because you sound just like my grandmother and she was a nasty woman. I didn't and know, she was from Scotland. That's what I was going to say. I didn't know your grandmother was from Scotland. Yeah, she How was. the hell do you go from having Scottish parents to ha uh, grandparents to having a Nobel Peace Prize? That's a hell of a leap. <laughs> Maternal grandmother was from Italy. Ah, uh, Italy. Uh, yes. Mariana Bertolino. Hi, mom. What's a coming ago? <laughs> what did you win the Nobel Prize for? I keep trying to think of smart ass answers, but I'm supposed to be polite. So. <laughs> you know, you, you win the Nobel Peace Prize, you become Mother Teresa, can't you tell? Uh, no, you, I, I don't think you're dead. 
just saying you, you didn't... Ooh. No, I wasn't being mean. I really wasn't. I could be. No, I, no, I'm not being mean to you. I'm not being mean to you. I, I was just saying... just like my grandmother. I'm you? not your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> You're no good. You'll yeah. never be any good. This sound familiar. And you smell like biscuits. Does that... Does that sound familiar? She did that to my father, not me. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, nice yeah. woman. Uh, you're making me homesick. I see you got some garlic over there. No, that's not garlic. That's a kangaroo's... <laughs> this... This is a kangaroo's scrotum. It looks, it looks like clove of garlic to me, and that's for the bite my vegetable thing that you... Are you a vegan? No. Well, then where are you going with this? I don't know. I just... <laughs> I heard you saying it, it kind of caught my imagination. All right, okay. So you won the Nobel Peace Prize yeah. for? Banning anti-personnel landmines. That's a great thing that you did. That's a great thing. I would agree. No. Tell me about the, uh, tell me about the, the Nobel Women's Initiative then. What is that? First, can I mention that I didn't do the banning of the landmines alone. Right. There were thousands and thousands of people in 90 countries around the world who thought just like I did, a bunch of ordinary people who came together and did the extraordinary. Right, got these landmines, wow, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you do now then with the Nobel Women's Initiative? What's that? I'm the chairwoman and um, in the 109 year history of the Peace Prize, there have only been 12 women who've received the Peace Prize. Sexism is rampant everywhere. Really? Yeah, I, you probably didn't notice. <laughs> Except for that. The kangaroos don't do well around here, but other than that, we're fine. <laughs> and seven of us are alive today, so that shows the real sexism previously. Do you know when women got the vote in Switzerland? Na They're 1999. <sighs> I know. You want to get over there and sort these Swiss out. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Is that true? Look it up. I look forward to your letters, Swiss people. <laughs> I have a wee bit of fondness for Switzerland. I got married in Geneva. You did? I fell in love with my husband in Geneva, banning landmines. That's adorable. It's true. <laughs> it is. Is your husband Swiss? No, he's American. He's from Kentucky. Kentucky, eh? They were neutral in the big one. I'm neutral in the big one, too, actually. <laughs> All right, so you want to know... I want to know what you do the, with the... No, no with, the, with the women's initiative and the Nobel thing, that thing. <laughs> well, the seven of us who are now alive, right. not dead. Do um, you solve crimes? <laughs> I could go with that one, but I won't. All right. I won't. I'm going to be a good girl, because okay. my mom's going to be watching, you know? Okay. Hi, Mom. You'd like <laughs> You'd like my mom. I, I'm sure I would. I yeah. like you. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty amusing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's seven of us. We got together because of the access and influence that in, in theory we have because of the Peace Prize. Right. To support the work of women around the world working for peace with justice and equality. Nice. Because I am sick of people thinking that peace is kumbaya, my lord. Bad peace poetry. Bad peace poetry. I look forward to your letters. <laughs> Send me your poems. I'll be a, cri a critic. Well, you, well, what, well, what does peace mean then if it doesn't mean... It is mean... not the absence of armed conflict. It is to have sustainable peace, you have to have justice. Mm -hmm. You have to have equality. Mm -hmm. You have to have the basic needs of people met so that they aren't all pissed off. One and of, you have to have the absence of armed conflict. Well, that's the baseline, honey. Right, right. That's a baseline. If you don't have the absence of armed conflict, you have no chance to make sustainable peace. But just stopping war is not peace. There are over, you know, several billion people in the world today who live on less than two dollars. Is I'm, that peace? No, to no, me, I'm, that is not peace. I was going to say, are you implying that war may have an economic purpose? Hell no. Okay. <laughs> Why would I think that? Well, I don't know. I just, uh, I've heard that kind of crazy talk floating around and it kind of well, gets know, my was... dander up, to be honest. I see your dander is up. Yeah, it is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it, it was up during the big one as well. <laughs> so, I heard... <laughs> So, so, so what, do you, what do you do then? I'm what practically do the, does the Nobel Women's Initiative do? What do you do? Well, we don't sign everything that says peace, for example. Just, right. you know, we actually support people when it makes a difference. If our 
if our intervention in any way by sending a letter of support, by showing up, makes a difference in the work they do, right on, we'll do it. Well, so is that like, if you, will you go to countries that are experiencing turmoil or armed conflict and then embarrass the people that are at the head of that? Uh, you know, by I'm saying, good at the embarrassing I part. noticed. And <laughs> All I'm saying is, do you, do you go there and do you do you kind No, it really depends. But for example, there was a very difficult case in Mexico, and there were 12 political prisoners, and it was the result of money. You'll be shocked to hear. Mm, yeah, I'm amazed. Shocked, yeah, amazed. Yeah. The Mexican government was um, taking some peasants' land in order to build a new international airport. Right. And the peasants actually rose up and created a, a non-governmental organization, and they fought back. Right. Not you know peacefully like I would. He's, All right. Oh, they only, actually armed conflict. No, 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 oh, no. Right. Peacefully, like I would, you know, protest in the street, that kind of stuff. Right. And uh, the government didn't like it and sent in 4,000 yeah, soldiers and, and police. Raped, I'm not, is that a word I can't say here? No, yeah, uh, that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah, raped 27 women, took 200 some odd to prison, and they held the. 12 men who are the leaders of the organization as political prisoners to, as a message to people, don't get in our way, it's our stuff, we're going to do whatever we want. And so I started going down there and met with members of the Supreme Court and lo and behold, they were freed. Wow. Yeah. What a... But I have to just add. And, but it's not, it's not just about that they were freed. It's the Supreme Court made a decision that Mexican people have the right to protest. Right. They have the right to freedom of expression. So was that constitutionally not their right before it, then? Well, it was under threat. It was under threat. And wow. if those people had been kept in prison simply because they were protesting right. the you know, wealthy people stealing their land, that right. would not have sent a very good message. Hmm. So we do that kind of thing. Do you ever feel that you yourself are in personal danger when you go into a situation like that? I've had unfortunate incidents in my life when I was in El Salvador. It, does it worry? Does it worry your husband? Does it worry your family when you go into these situations? I didn't fall in love till I was 45, so I wasn't involved. Well, he's, he still probably loves you, though, even although you, you were 45. <laughs> You're probably concerned about your welfare. Ah, she's 45, I'll get another one. No, oh, come on. I, he, he still... No, he, no, no. I just, does he go with you? I just ran around until I was 45. Yes, I... No, I was Mother Teresa till I was 45. Mm -hmm. Then I fell in love and, you know, all that goes with that. Prior to that time... <laughs> Prior to that time, you, what, you, you were with kangaroos? I knew you were going to say that. No, I wear that for vampire. It's, never it's vampire. not garlic. You don't, I mean, if you wore that, a vampire would go, well, this isn't a problem at all. It's the kangaroo testicles. I'm old school vampire. I don't do the new vampire. My vampire sounds like this. I didn't know that vampires were gay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, some of them are. Gay vampires. Really? Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> Why not? I have no idea, really, actually. What do you think about that don't ask, don't tell thing? If you don't ask, I won't tell. <laughs> I, I just did ask. I asked you what you thought of it. <laughs> you like my boots? I do. Not, actually, I do like your boots. Yeah, I like you see that. how they sparkle? Yeah. <laughs> the only... F what? The only thing W and I had in common was an appreciation for a good pair of boots. Yeah, well, that's a start. <laughs> We're out of time. Um, awkward pause or harmonica? <laughs> I think I just answered the question. Okay, awkward pause on this. You ready? Yeah. What are we doing? We're doing an awkward pause. It's very. <laughs> An important part of talk show, you know, business. Really? Yeah. You dumping me already? Yeah. That's pretty rude. You gave two to a whole show. I did give two to a whole show, but but to, to be fair, he uh, he, he travelled a lot further than Vermont. <laughs> I mean, he came in from South Africa. That's a long way. You came in from half that distance. I give I you half the amount of time. Thank you very much for this honor. 
after about 50 years of producing late night television, I have the privilege of working with the charming, bright, and enormously talented Scotsman, Craig Ferguson. At CBS, we are fortunate to showcase not just actors and actresses, but important figures in literature, the media, and politics. And for one night, the night that earned us the Peabody Award, we were able to have as our guest one of the most important figures of the century, a man who changed the course of a nation and influenced the world, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In honoring us, you are honoring him. Although he had never been on an American talk show, my colleague, Lisa Ammerman, refused to accept no. Craig is sorry he couldn't be here today. He's in Los Angeles working hard, but he wanted to send his thanks to the Peabody judges in particular for this wonderful honor. He asked me to read a, sh read a short message, and it's the following. It is unlikely that our show will lapse into quality like this again. <laughs> so our thanks to all of you for recognizing our brief moment of excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you.